and welcome to today's sessions where we'll talk to you about social network analysis, particularly about network structure. So we will not yet get into network dynamics or into changing networks. We will take a static snapshot of our network and look at the structure of the network. So if we take our computational uh, scientific methods, where does that fit in? Well, we have these two two extremes, right? The, the, kind of like the beginning at the end, we have our empirical observations, what reality gives us. And on the other hand, we have uh, the world of thoughts, kind of like the, the, the theory. And social network analysis, as the word already says, is in between. It's an analytical uh, method, and we can analyze some. And we can we can get to it from both ways. We can go from empirical data and analyze it. That's what we will do a lot today. But we can also do theory. Right? We can create networks that don't necessarily exist in reality, and 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 and, and explore theoretical possibilities of, of these network config configurations and evolutions. But today we will stay more here, uh, looking at how data is being transformed and, and, and then analyzed in, in network form. We will do so by answering three questions. First, how can we formalize networks, making, making a science out of it? Second, how can we describe the structure of networks, differentiating different networks and what makes them different? And third, uh, we get we get a hands-on and uh, start a little lab and talking about how can we analyze a network with software. Now, formalizing network has some benefits, not only doing it computationally, you can also doing it by hand because then suddenly you see your network, you, you, you make it visual. For example, this is here uh, a toolbox when I used to work in international development uh, with the World Bank and with the United Nations. This toolbox has been used to bring people together and basically once you have local conflicts, for example, in a community, in a village, in a local government or municipality, you will bring these people together and basically just say, well, draw out the network. Of, of who's involved into this into this conflict. And people would sit down and draw out the network for one or two days and things would become rather clear. Also, what would become clear how different people see a network and how they imagine an, the, the same network and, and what they think, who is connected to whom and, and for what reason. And afterwards, you know, you can use this visualization in order to resolve this network analysis to resolve conflicts. It's been a very successful tool that's been applied. So all of this being said, let's start out with drawing out one of your personal networks. Could be your family, could be your friends. Um, please feel free to use a piece of paper and just draw it out on your desk or go to an online application. And just that, just draw out one of your social networks. All right, how was it? How does it look? Well, you probably had to make some decisions. You, you also probably ran into some problems, some questions. For example, who was in the middle of your network? Well, maybe you. And then how did you expand the network? Did you snowball it out? That's a technical term. And did you go to your first degree friends, second degree friends or family members maybe? Um, maybe there were some connections were stronger than other connections. Right? Did you have, maybe you had that. Maybe at the end you kind of like felt like, oh, oh I have to reorganize all of that. I mean, I, I just, I, I rather would put this person here and that other person here. And so there are many things. And, and it, maybe you had some connections that were directed, kind of like this one person connects to the other one, but not the other way around. Right? So there are many decisions we have to take. And even so, as intuitive as it might be for us human beings thinking in networks, because we think in society and, and, and that is networks, there are many decisions we have to take. And so today we will talk more systematically about some of these decisions and how we can think about them. And we also have some good guidance and best practices of how to effectively, efficiently analyze networks and what to look at in networks, what gives us insights. So as a first question, in general, you have to decide what are the nodes, right? A network basically is a bunch of dots and lines when it's formalized, when it's represented. That's, that's what basically what it comes down to. And 
uh, the nodes, I, I, I call them nodes, there are different terms uh, for them, and uh, they can represent different things. Now, in the network that you probably drew out, they were people, maybe family members, maybe friends, maybe colleagues from your, from your sports team or, or classmates, and, uh, but they can be other things. So, uh, people, they're often people in social network analysis. For example, here uh, we see a high school, a high school uh, mapped out, and you can see that actually also the network structure already reveals something. Uh, the nodes, how they are connected, creates a structure. They're separated by race. That means uh, African American kids used to hang together, uh, usually hang together with African American kids, and uh, uh, students from white ethnicity uh, more connect more with students from white ethnicity. As you can see, there's also some 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 bridges, some borders. But that's a, a, a phenomenon we see quite often. We will talk about that later. It's called homophily. We also see that in online networks a lot. So these are Republican and Democrats, uh, and, and how they connect in political blocks, and that creates the famous echo chambers, that's what it's called, that you basically only hear the echo of the like-minded, right? So that means that the attribute of the node connects with the like-minded. More about that later. But in these cases, um, the nodes are, are basically people. But they can also be organizational units. For example, this an, is an organigram, that's a technical term for it. For example, how, an, how a government is organized or how a company is organized, how a university is organized. Now there's the presidency, the director, the CAO on top, and then that's a network. Basically, it's a network. It tells you who reports to whom, right? And here the nodes are organizational units. The nodes can also be entire organizations. That's here a study from, from Woody Powell who, who looked into how to create a biotechnology cluster and why the biotechnology cluster, uh, the industry, in San Diego was so successful in contrast to Los Angeles, where it was not so successful. And what he found is that it had to do with the network and especially how these biotechnology companies connected to the university. So it's the network that made it successful to create a cluster, a technology cluster, a new industry, whereas in that case of Los Angeles, the network was not formed around the university and the biotechnology industry never took off. So in this case, the nodes are organization, companies, universities. They can also be product, that's from Cesar Hidalgo, um, a, a schematization where he basically made a network of product, also the product space. And you can see that what countries produce, if they produce, well, some countries produce more agricultural products, other, one, other countries produce more technological products. You can see that actually the economy of a country kind of like walks through this network. So in order to become a high-tech producing country, you kind of like, you know, you, you walk through this network and you cannot, you cannot basically jump. You need to find your way through this network to become from an agricultural uh, economy, become a high tech economy, for example. So here, the nodes are products. And the nodes, of course, can also be country. This is a trade network. So these are different countries that trade with each other in the world. And you can also see something in, in, in many of these applications you already see. Nodes have different colors. So these are called node attributes. So in the, in the trade network, for example, uh, the yellow are European countries, the blue are American countries, uh, and the red are, are Asian countries. So according to the attribute, we color them differently. We could also shape them differently, making a triangles or stars and not always making them round, round balls. But the idea is that, that they have, that they have different attributes. And the node attributes are very important. So if you come back to the idea of homophily that I just mentioned, that is actually a very old insight from 1545 where William Turner said, Brides of a kind and color flock and fly always to, I, I don't have a good, I don't have a good 15th, 16th century uh, accent, but what we say nowadays, birds of a feather flock together. So you kind of like, you hang out with the people who are like you. And, and I already showed you two examples here from a high school and from blocks. So the node attributes have something to do with the network structure. Uh, it's a, the theory goes back uh, to Lazarfeld and Merton in, in the 50s in communication in our discipline. 
And we see that a lot. For example, interracial marriages are, are very, have a very high degree of homophily. So 1% of whites are only in interracial marriages, 5% of blacks are only in interracial marriages, and only 14% of Asians. Right? Closest friends, the same. Your closest friend, only 10% of men have a closest friend as a woman, and 30% of women have a closest friend as a man. So kind of like go together with what is the attribute. That's the people we also link up with. The reasons for homophily, there are several social science theories, and unfortunately, that's actually a very rich part of social science. They're connected to the theories. I don't have time to get through it. But one is a contract theory. So it's kind of like a path dependency. So you, you used to hang out with the same people and you continue to hang out with the same people. And this kind of like locks you in into the path on where, where you are. Transaction, transaction theory is like a transaction cost theory. So it has to do with that people who are like you have share a common culture. They share the same Weltanschauung, which, which facilitates communication. So you hang out with people who are like you because it's just, it's just easier. There's less transaction cost in order to communicate. Social pressure. So dialectic theory, the current narrative prejudices are as well often now. You hang out with these, you hang out with, I don't know, with the poor or with the rich or with the hipsters. So there's a social pressure element to it. And social competition as well, evolutionary theory. So you can explain it with that. So you hang together with like mind also to protect yourself. It's kind of like a kin, kin selection argument. With families, you see that a lot. So uh, in, in, in some cultures, families really lock together and then they support each other and even very much extended families, third degree cousins and so forth. That you could explain that with kind of like an evolutionary, with an evolutionary theory. Now, once you know, you can also turn this around, right? Once it's given, given that homophily is, is, is so, is so prevalent, once you know who you're connected with, you also have a very high probability of finding out who you are. So, for example, in this study here, without any information about a Facebook user, beyond a list of, of your friends, um, you, you can very accurately predict uh, sexual orientation. For example, if you're homosexual or heterosexual. And, uh, this might be, this might be scary in some, in some ways. And, and th with the digital footprint, many of these things become very predictable. But in this case, we make the prediction, even if you don't post your orientation, just by seeing who you hang out with. The other way around also, who you hang out with can also influence who you might become. For example, if you hang out with happy people. We see that also it's kind of like happiness is contagious. Even obesity, one has found out, is kind of like contagious, not like because you touch somebody, but you hang out with people that have a certain culture, um, you, you more or less uh, become like them. And that's a very old insight. It's kind of like your mother always said, you know, be careful who you hang out with, because who you hang out with, you know, yes, that has an effect on you. And that goes back to this formal concept called homophily. So now we talked about nodes with different attributes, but to complicate things, there can also be different kind of nodes in the same network. So this is often called multi-mode or multimodal network. So for example, here's an example. Here we have a network of people, Larry, Chuck, and Andrea, that's a social network. And each of them has different skills. So for example, Larry, um, has a skill in, 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 in circuit design and Andrea has skills in marketing. Now these are the yellow nodes. These are the skills. And now we can connect them to different tasks. These are the blue nodes. So Andrea with her skills in marketing is connected to the task of sales and Larry with the skill of circuit design is connected to uh, the task of, of design. So now we can see how this network connects and analyze if the right people with the adequate skills are connected to the right task. All right, so, so far so good, but how does that relate now to the attributes? Because I could also just say, you know, everybody of the nodes, if they have a skill in marketing, I color the node a different color, all right? And, and and I explain that all, uh, all of these things to you because it is really 
in the eye of the beholder. That's, that's kind of like how you decided to do. You can make a network with different kinds of nodes, a multimodal network, or you can also, could also, just as we did before, just use an attribute of the node and kind of like put them together. And that's, that's the art of doing science. It's an extremely creative act and you have to find the right representation, a meaningful representation. An, an incredibly creative act to, to find the right representation in order to convey and analyze what you actually want to analyze and what you want to convey. I mean, there are some rules you can guide yourself with. So, so often, um, if you use a new kind of node, if it's exclusive, so uh, if it's if it's not if it's not very overlapping. So if if many people if many people have skills in marketing and it's overlapping, it's kind of like spread all over. Then you might make it an attribute. Whereas if only two or three people have skills in marketing and other non and another non overlapping group has skills in circuit design and they're not overlapping too much, then you might as well make that a different node and then it's often very useful. But I show you all these things because it's really designing a network just when you drew it out is Often a subjective, it, it starts as a subjective task, but then at the end, you find a right representation to show you something interesting. And that's the art of doing science. How do I represent reality? And how do I represent realities like social networks? All right, so now we talked about the nodes, kind of like the dots in the network. Let's talk about the links. What is a link and, and what can links represent? Well, I'm in the Department of Communication, of course, that can be communication. And often it is, it is communication, especially if you work with the digital footprint of social media and so forth. It's the link is when, when two people entities communicate with each other, but it can also be something different. So for example, this is an example from biology where you have a food web, a food network. So it's who eats who. The goat eats the plant and then the wolf eats the goat. So that's, that's a network that you can analyze and you can see the food web that emerges from that. It can also be just visual contact. It doesn't have to be a, a verbal or a written communication. Here, for example, in this study, they put glasses on people and actually analyzed where people look at and, and what is their visual network if you, if you would draw that out. And in this school class, in this, in this elementary school class, what they found is that students only look 3% of the time at the teacher. That's the same percentage they look at each other, at all of the other classmates. So Everybody in the room, they look 3% of the time, which is pretty sad for a teacher, but it gives you very interesting insights. So you have the visual network that you can map out. For example, this is in a metro station as well, where you can map out the visual network, see what actually, where do people actually look at? Here you have another network, which is joint use. So if you use two things together, they are, they are connected because they are used together. So here what that is, is, uh, a lot of cookbooks and what ingredients in these cookbooks go into the same recipe. And if they go into the same recipe, we make a link to connect them. And then you can see you get actually two clusters, right? So that the nodes here are ingredients and you can see that white sugar and butter are very close together. They're connected. And, and in the other class, that's kind of like the sweet cluster. And in the other cluster, you have kind of like a hearty cluster with more hearty food, with, with vegetables and so forth. And, and you have some bridge builders, water, for example, and salt are the bridge builders between, between these two communities that we find in the network. And a network connection can also be a sequence in time. So the joint use is kind of like, you know, we use them together in space, but it can also be in time. It can be a connection in time. So for example, if uh, a person works in this company now and then switches to, these, to the other company, both companies are connected. You could abstract it like this, model it like this. Now it's very ingenious and, and social science and science in general is about how do you best abstract it. But yes, you would present actually the mobility between companies, when people move among companies, as a labor flow network. That's, that's how it's been called here in this study. And you see that if, if uh, a lot of people switch from one company of another, well, these companies are, are connected because many people switched and, and many people maybe switched uh, vice versa. And you can see how workers flow through this labor flow network here. So what a connection here is, is not a joint use 
at this moment is a connection in time, a sequence, and, and that is a connection. So again, as always in science, it's, it's the creativity, the ingenuity of the scientist to model something, to abstract from reality and create something meaningfully in order for us to better grasp what is actually going on. In reality, when you start modeling, you will find many different alternative links that you could work with. And then it's for you to decide which kind of connection do you actually want to represent in your model. So for example, here's a famous study of a social network analysis in a company. And it's the, this is the organigram, that's basically the organizational chart of this company. And the CAO made this one uh, person called Calder, he made him senior vice president, one of his four managers. Right? And if you ask around in the company, so these consultants also went in, the company didn't go very well. There was a problem. So these, company, these consultants went in and asked around and the first question they ask is, who do you go for for work-related advice? It's called an advice network. We often do that. It's very important. Who do you go for for advice? And we can see that Calder is basically in, in, in pretty much in the center of this network. Many people go to Calder for advice. However, if we ask another question is, for example, who would you trust to keep in confidence your concern? That's a trust network. It's a different question. You will get a different network. So here, for example, Calder is at the periphery of this network. So people don't seem to trust Calder a lot. Now, if you would ask the CAO to draw out this network, CAO, how, who do you think who trusts whom in their company? The CEO drew it out and the network looks completely, looks completely different. So here, well, Calder is pretty much in the middle. That's why he also appointed it. What, what the paper says is um, the CAO appointed Calder manager because his colleagues respected him as the most technically accomplished person. That's common practice. Make your best producer the manager. Calder, however, turned out to be a very marginal figure in the trust network. He regularly told people they were stupid and paid little attention to their professional concerns. Lears, the CEO, knew that Calder was no diplomat, uh, but he had no idea to what extent the performance and morale of the group were suffering as a result of Calder's tyrannical management style. Frequently, senior managers presume that formal work ties will yield good relationships over time. And they assume that if they trust someone, others will too. Now, that's often not the case. And if you go around and actually do these network analysis in companies, you will find out why the company, for example, is not productive. <laughs> One thing that I always find interesting if you do these studies, who is often in the center of the network is, is the secretary. One with the lowest salary in the company, but everything flows together at the secretary. She or he actually knows everything was going on and has a much more actually important role in holding the company together. Because if, if you would lose the secretary, the network would kind of like fall apart. Right? So it's very important to understand who has which roles. And you can do, you can understand that better by drawing up these networks. Now, here we have different kind of links. We have an advice network and we have a trust network. So these are different kind of links. Same as we could have different kind of nodes, we can have different kind of links. And that is called a multiplex network. So different kind of nodes is a multi-mode, a multimodal network. And different kind of links is a multiplex network. So here, for example, you see a multiplex network of Europe, you have a network of transportation, a network of telecommunication, uh, different kinds of transportation networks, air, the train, car, and so forth. And you can draw them together and then see how they complement each other. So you have different layers of networks. The nodes are kind of like stable. If you do a, a purely multiplex analysis, the nodes are kind of like predefined, but they're different kinds of connections that, that connect each other. So that's, that's called multiplex. Again, a lot of that is in the eye of the beholder. It's up to your creativity. How do you create that? And, and very good researchers, people that we follow and that admire what their contribution is, that they represent reality in an extremely useful way. 
and be like, wow, yeah, that, that makes sense. That's a really smart person. This person explained it to us. How did this person do that? Well, by representing reality in a way that the things that matter are actually represented and we can look at them and understand them better. So it's a very creative, creative process of choosing also in this case, again, what are nodes and what are links. And if you want to work with multiple nodes and multiple links, multimodal and multiplex networks. All of that being said, now comes my favorite part. Now I will completely confuse you. Now, now honestly, look, look, guys, I really try, try extremely hard uh, not to confuse you. I really make, I, I, I try to make an effort to explain these very uh, complicated things in very simple, sometimes overly simplistic uh, terms because I also have to explain them to myself. So really, I, 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 what I least like is, is confusing you. But I have to show you these things because it is confusing. It is uh, often subjective in the eye of the beholder. And at the end, only time will tell if a representation, a a social science or a science representation in general turns out to be useful or not. Sometimes we do not know for a very long time if it turns out to be useful. All right, all of this being said, again, another choice you could make of representing networks. We, the question was, how do we formalize network? So you have a multi-mode network, just like I drew out here. That's a multi-mode network, right? You have the blue nodes and you have the yellow nodes. You could think about the blue nodes maybe as people and the yellow nodes could be technology. So they connect through cell phones or computers or, 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 or web pages, social media pages, they connect to each other, right? And that's a multi-mode network. Now I can take these nodes and convert them into links as well. So, uh, so here I draw, draw exactly the same network again. And then what I do, for example, the node E and F is connected by one node. So for example, maybe they, they connect on a web page or they are in the same committee or they work in the same company. So basically I can take also this node and, and, and replace it by a link. Right? Same between B and D, there's one connection, I can replace it by a link. Now between B and E, there are two connections. Okay, so I make a stronger tie, I make a stronger link here with strength of two and then between a and B there too, between A and C is one, between C and B, check that out. So that's, so, so how, that's how I can convert that. You wanna see that again? So I had this before and then I converted to that. Now, I have this other network and these two networks are basically equivalent. Again, that's, <laughs> that's the creativity. If you wanna go with this one or you wanna go with this one, that's up to you and one of them will turn out useful uh, and the other one or more useful than the other. Maybe, probably, it depends also often on the question that you ask. For some question, one representation might be more useful than the other, but in reality, none of these exist. Right, we do science here, we, we abstract from reality and do social science. Um, so none of them exists. It's for time and for tests and for results to tell which one is the more useful representation. But I wanted to take all this time to show you how actually, yes, how, how much of that is in the eye of the beholder. Now, as fuzzy and subjective as that might, might appear at first glance, uh, I now show you an example that uh, shows that what you pick and how you represent it uh, can change your conclusions. For example, the theory of evolution, right? The theory of evolution coming from genetics holds that evolution acts on who you are, what kind of genes you have. So when Darwin went to Galapagos, he found finches with long peaks and, and, and shorter peaks. And then he analyzed that actually the finches with longer peaks uh, out evolved the other ones. They, they were fitter. So if the, the longer peaks would be the white one and the, and the, uh, the shorter peaks would be the gray ones, the white ones are fitter than the other ones. They grow, they grow faster. Now in social science, there's also a lot of theories where evolution has been applied to social science. Actually, Darwin got inspired by studying the stock market. So the theory of evolution kind of like inspired by social evolution, how the stock market evolved. He studied that a lot. So we could also say the white nodes are tech companies and the gray notes are manufacturing companies or agricultural companies. And then we can see, well, the, the tech companies out evolve the manufacturing companies. They, they are fitter in this, in this environment. Now, 
but we don't consider here who, who, who actually connects with whom. So evolution might not only act on who you are, especially in social evolution, but also with whom you are. So for example, if I include this kind of information, here I have exactly my same dots, my same eight dots, uh, but I turns out that I found and I just made this up. It turns out that I found that the upper four are connected, like kind of like the left four are connected and the lower right four are connected. They're also loosely connected among themselves, but they're clearly two groups. And now I can ask which of these groups is actually fitter. Now, again, I have exactly my same growth rates, uh, and it turns out that the upper left group grows like this, and the lower right group actually grows faster. So instead of looking at the evolution of who you are, it might also be that evolutionary pressure, competitive pressure, market selection in the social sciences acts on with whom you are. And in this case, agglomeration of three gray companies and one white companies wins the day. They are the most effective collaboration. And what we found in the study here uh, that, that I did with two, two colleagues is that actually evolutionary pressure, natural selection as an evolutionary pressure, it acts much stronger on with whom you are in social science data, we tested that, instead of acting on who these social entities are. So how you represent reality, and if you consider and not consider network connections, and which kind of network connections you actually model can have different results of understanding reality. So what evolves, for example, as I, as, as, as I showed here in this study, a very, very important question. Another question that you might have run into when drawing up your own network concerns the strength of the ties of the link. So while the first question is, the question is, is there a link or is there not a link? Uh, the second question asks about the intensity. So it might be that with some people, you hang out more frequently or you have known them long or you just have a stronger feeling towards them, you feel closer. So there's a difference in the intensity of the connection, and that has to do with the strength of the ties. Often in reality, if you just, I mean, there's always a difference in strength of ties, but often when we analyze network, we dichotomize it. So it's dichotomization, that's the technical term, that basically means we convert them into ones and zeros. So actually there is a connection or there's no connection, but in reality, there are always shades of grays. It's just to make analysis simpler. We sometimes draw a link and or do not draw a link. So the person who made the name of analyzing actually the strength of the ties and the strength of the weak ties is Granewetter. And he wrote this paper in 1973, which is uh, an incredibly uh, much cited paper. So the number of citations that this paper has around 50,000 is this right now is the same number of citations that Darwin's Origin of Species has, right? So it's one of the most cited paper in the social sciences. And what, what Granewetter found here is he analyzed how people actually find jobs. So how do you find a job? Do your best buddies, your closest families get you a job? Kind of like who makes the connection for you to find a job? And he found that strong ties uh, get you a job in 17% of the times, medium ties in 56% of the times, but weak ties, weak ties, people that you interact with less than once a year provide your job in 28% in of the times. So he called this paper the strength of the weak ties. So even so they're weak ties, I mean, all of your 1,500 Facebook friends? No, I'm just kidding, I don't know. But there are many weak ties that might come in useful. That's actually what, what, what this finding is about the strength of weak ties. Now, be careful. There are naturally much more weak ties than strong ties. So just the probability might be much higher because you just have many more weak ties. You, 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 you cannot keep strong ties with too many people. Just you simply run out of time and out of energy. But even if there are few, even if there are few uh, weak ties, they build important bridges. That's something called the small world phenomena. And we will get to that in a, in a different lecture. Being aware that ties have always a different degrees, have different strength, and sometimes they might just be very weak but still be there leads to the question, like, where does the network end, right? Because at the end, aren't we kind of like all connected uh, on this globe? 
I mean, we're in the same atmosphere. We breathe. We breathe the same. We breathe the same air. We are the same species. So actually, shouldn't we? Shouldn't we, when we draw our network, actually include include all the seven or eight billion people that are in? And if we are that at that already, we are also in the same Milky Way, and we are in the same actually galaxy. We are in the same universe. So actually, when we draw the network, shouldn't we actually draw out the entire network as it? Well, that leads to very interesting questions, right? So at one point, you have to make a cut, and you have to see where the network. Actually ends, and that's again, again, once more, kind of like in the eye, in the in the eye of the world, in, in the creativity of the artist, the scientist who models reality. So, if I start with that network, that might be similar to the network that you have been drawing up, right? Uh, honestly, you forgot your if you drew up a family, you forgot your cousin of second degree. And if you drew up a friend's network, you forgot a friend of a friend, a friend of a friend of a friend that actually you also know, you just, it just didn't occur to you, but you also know. So actually it's a bigger network. And then if you think a little harder, you will realize, oh, it's actually, it's actually a much bigger network. Now, once we have such a big network as here, we might as well that take that same network and look at something different. Look at a different group of people and they are two different networks now. Right. But these two networks, they come from the same reality. And once again, so the main point of, uh, of what I've been talking about uh, today is, well, if you model something as abstract as a network, which is as natural to society, still it's in the modelers, in the modelers eye of the beholder to, to see what actually matters and where to cut off the network is one extremely important decision that you will have to take when you model networks. And last but not least, to wrap up this tour de force through some different challenges that, that we encounter when we model networks is how to design a network. And, and that's called layout algorithm. So here I have a network. That's a network I actually drew. Uh, it's, it's science and technology companies in Brazil. And I drew up this network. Turns out that this is exactly the same network. I just pressed a button on my, on my network analysis software and it spread out the same nodes differently. Turns out that this is also exactly the same network. And it turns out that this is also exactly the same network. So it's just the algorithm that spreads it out, uh, pulls it in different directions, and that can be, on the one hand, extremely deceiving. So that's why we usually calculate our network metrics, and we will talk more about that in a bit. So it, it's much more useful often to calculate the network. And what I often do is uh, I look at the network first, but I know it's deceptive, so then I, I calculate my network metrics, I calculate something about the network, and I know what role different nodes play and what role different links play. And once I find out what matters, then I show the network representation, telling the story that I want to tell. Because there are many different ways you can present a network, and which is the right one depends on the story that you want to tell with this, with this network. So it can be very deceptive, but also different layered algorithms can be very insightful. You can learn something about a very confusing network if you just represent it in the right way. And often scientific insights are just ingenious changes in the way a problem is represented. And once you change it to a way that you think, oh, well, that makes sense. That's a big scientific breakthrough. And from there on, we kind of like tend to use if it's really useful. We all continue to, to look at this problem as, as the scientific breakthrough showed us. And I want to show you here a little video of how a change in representation can actually give us some important insights and turn one of these spaghetti or hairball diagrams, these are actually technical terms, network anal analysts use that hairball or, or spaghetti diagrams, turn them into uh, scientific insights that are extremely useful. Have a look. That wraps up a little overview to the force through some of the topics, challenges that we face when we try to formalize networks. And as a final thought, let me go a little bit more schematically about it. So here we have uh, four nodes, uh, four nodes that represent, for example, people. In this case, they represent Jorge, Maria, Juan, y Magda. And I can have my traditional database about it. So if you ever had 
uh, an introductory statistics class, uh, even in high school or here. That's kind of like the database of just different people with different attributes. So for example, here, we know that Jorge is masculine, Maria is feminine, that's why they're white. Jorge is again blue, is masculine, and Magda is feminine. So that's why they're represented here, white and, white and blue. Now you can have other attributes, location, for example, the triangles are live in cities, they're urban, and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the round uh, circles live in rural areas in the countryside. So, and I can analyze that and I can do a lot of science with that already. I can see, does gender depend on location or does rural urban depend on income or the other way around? Do they go together or education? And I can do a lot of analysis to see uh, if there are some differences, for example, in this traditional database. Now, what I do when I do social network analysis is I add a second kind of database. I still work with the first one. Uh, I call this node attributes. That's what we traditionally do with statistics. But now I have additionally also these links. The database for that looks a little bit differently. It's called an adjacency matrix. That's how we represent it here. And what we have in the row and the column is the same people. So it's not like we have the people and then we have the attributes. We have the same people and the same people. Jorge, Maria, Juan y Magda, Jorge, Maria, Juan y Magda. And then as you can see here in this image, we can now think about who is connected with whom. So for example, Jorge, but well, it's connected to himself. Well, hopefully we don't know. And honestly, the self-connection, you can make it or you cannot make it. Often it doesn't matter. Sometimes it matters. For example, if, if a politician votes for himself, yeah, in that case, it doesn't make sense. But if you're a friend with yourself, maybe you could, but you know. So yeah, uh, do you go to yourself for advice? Do you trust yourself? <laughs> sometimes it matters, sometimes it doesn't. So, okay. So Jorge is connected to himself. We just assume that. He's connected to Maria. Right, you see this connection here. Uh, he's not connected to Juan, uh, but he is connected to Magda. And these adjacency matrix, you usually read them from right to left. So you, that's, how, that's how you read the matrix. Uh, Maria is connected to Jorge, connected to herself, not connected to Juan, but yes, she is connected to Magda. Juan is only connected to himself. Right, he's not, he's not connected, there's no link going from him to anywhere else. What about Magda? Try to fill up the last row for yourself. Who is Magda connected to and who not? What goes into these four cells? So Magda is not connected to Jorge. There's no connection from Magda to Jorge, but Magda is connected to Maria, is connected uh, to Juan as well, actually the only person connected to Juan, and, well, we assume that Magda is connected to herself. So with this adjacency matrix, actually, I have an additional database that I can now do analysis with. And that, that does matter, actually, when I do then, when I try to, for example, if you think about the example of, of evolution that I showed you, uh, in the one hand, you can ask about well, who evolves? Is it just the attributes of the nodes? Or is it with whom you evolve? Then you would use this other, the second database. If you would work, then you would just work with the adjacency matrix. And of course, the best is always having more information. You would try to combine them and work with both of them. And sometimes, often, very often, they are also connected. As for example, in the case of homophily. Okay, that wraps up our first question. How can we formalize network? And I said, well, basically, you have a lot of options that you have to struggle with. Some of them are intuitive, some are not so intuitive. And some of them you don't find out if they're useful until you finish your analysis. And then you go back and forth or somebody else improves on your representation and so forth. But a network is a pretty abstract thing, as important as it is for society. It's an abstract, it's an abstraction of reality. And that comes with many choices that we have to model it. All right. So second question is, how can we describe the structure of networks? And that leads us uh, to many different terms that some of them we actually use very commonly and is a very important, for example, gatekeeper, broker, intermediary, bottleneck, coordinator, bridge, amplifier, or, or somebody who has a central role, a central role, a central role in the network, uh, or somebody who intermediates. So we use these terms, but we don't really, we kind of like qualitatively give characteristics to it 
Now, the good news is with social network analysis, we can make that really clearly defined. So it's a clear definition. You can clearly define how much intermediator actually an intermediator is, how much bottleneck a bottleneck actually is, because that can be defined in the structure of the network. So, for example, here's an analysis that we did a network in Chile. It's a Twitter network of a Chilean ecological protest. And if you can zoom in here, you will see that there are some, the red nodes, these are basically radio stations or, or protest organizers. We call them voices just to give them a name. And then you see these other, these green dots, which are kind of like amplifier. It turns out that they are celebrities, for example, could be a sports celebrity, but you can see this other group here that actually only gets the news about this environmental cause from this Amplifier. They don't get their news from the news station or they don't get their news from the protest organizers. They get the news mediated by this kind of like a microphone that amplifies the message, that amplifies the message out. That's why we call them amplifiers. And you can see that often, for example, nowadays in microblogging uh, website services like Twitter, that you have these amplifiers. Many people get their news, their updates from celebrities, for example, be it sports, be it entertainment and so forth who amplify this kind of message. And now you can actually measure how much amplifier who actually is and what role they play in the communicative structure of these networks. And if traditional outlets lose importance and how important who is in this kind of network. So that leads us to a lot of network jargon. I already mentioned some and, and I'm not going to bore you and walk you through a dictionary of jargons today, but we will have to have some in general. In general, I, I will tell you there are some of these words that are well known, but they have a very specific meaning. For example, you know the word clique. Well, that's a clique. That's kind of like people who hang together. So we have a very concrete definition of what a clique is or a cluster or a bridge builder, an intermediate, an intermediator. We have very clear definitions of these words in social network analysis. Other words might sound new, but they're usually taken from somewhere else. Homophily, for example, is a word that I already introduced. Transitivity comes from mathematics, same as degree, a degree or the edge. That's basically the link. It has also a very concrete definition in, in network, uh, in network analysis, geodesic distance. We will talk about that. And others, again, uh, these terms have been born kind of like in network analysis. So for example, weak ties, uh, small world, triadic closure. So these are new terms. But so we have a bunch of different terms. And the more you get into network analysis, people will talk with these jargons. It's, 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 uh, it's it's our own it's our own language that you have to learn when you do network analysis, but it's often very intuitive, just as amplifiers and, and, and cliques and so forth, as you as you will see now, hopefully. Now, what complicates that is always, uh, especially if you have something as interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary as, as network analysis, is if people come from different disciplines, uh, they might call the same things different, differently. Uh, with different terms. And I just I have to put this caveat in here. It's kind of like a footnote, so be careful with that. And it starts already, I called uh, nodes nodes and links links so that's more a jargon that's used in computer science uh, in 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 physics they might call them sites and bonds that comes more from chemistry in mathematics actually in traditional mathematics they call the nodes vertices and the lines edges or arcs because they have mathematically they have to do with it in sociology they might call the nodes actors Yes, they're often people in sociology and the, the links, they call them ties or relations. And, and to really confuse things, the word network is often synonymous with the word graph. So you can have graph analysis as well because it's, it's, it's a graph. So you have to be careful with that a little bit and it might be a little confusing if you read some different things, but that's actually makes it very rich because network analysis in a very interdisciplinary field People coming from chemistry, physics, sociology, computer science, and mathematics working on it. And it makes it, makes it very rich, but we also have this challenge of finding, finding the right definitions. Okay. Some things are very clearly defined, and I'm just gonna walk you through some of them already. If you have a node that's not connected, it's called an isolate. Well, that makes sense. It's isolated. If you have a node that's only kind of like pending and connected to one other node, kind of like 
loosely appended to it, it's called a pendant. That also makes sense. Uh, if you have two notes connected, you call about you, call, you talk about a dyad. Diets is often a unit of analysis, so how two go together. Another important unit of analysis is a triad. These are these triangles, which are very important in social networks. Kind of like you and your friend, and the friend of your friend is also your friend. Kind of like this, this triad group, which is very common, especially in, in social networks. Another thing that is very clearly defined and where we have to make a first, first difference when we measure when we measure networks is we have directed and undirected networks. So for example, a network could be a Twitter communication network. I can communicate to you, that's kind of like a broadcast network, but you don't necessarily have to communicate to me. You don't have to broadcast to me. So it's an asymmetric network where I have a directionality in the communication pattern. Whereas on Facebook, if we are friends, there's no directionality. I mean, if, if, if we are connected on Facebook, we are both connected. So it's not like I can friend you on Facebook, but you cannot friend me. So for example, if, or another thing would be if we go to lunch together. It's not like I can go to lunch with you and you cannot go to lunch with me. So these are naturally undirected networks. Now be careful. <laughs> Friendship networks are only undirected in Facebook. In reality, and that's actually quite sad, they are highly directed, uh, highly uh, asymmetrical, asymmetrical networks. So uh, who you think are your friends, once you ask them, you get a very different answer, <laughs> which, is, which is really kind of like sad, but that's, that's actually really fine. On Facebook, however, yes, if you're friends with somebody, they will automatically also be with you. So directed networks, are asymmetric and undirected networks are symmetric networks. Now a degree, and that's a technical term, a degree that is the number of links of each node. So actually each link has two degrees, one for each node that it connects to. Right, so if you talk about links, you have one, and if you talk about degrees, you have two, two degrees per, per, because it connects to two different nodes. Very important distinction. And these degrees then in uh, directed networks can be in degrees, that's the number of incoming links to the nodes, and out degrees, the number of outgoing links to a node. In undirected networks, you don't have this distinction between in degree and out degree, but you still have two degrees because it docks onto two nodes, right? Uh, and degrees are just the total number of in degrees and out degrees. So now you can ask different questions, right? How many degrees does this network have? How many degrees, what's the degree of Magda? What's the degree of Magda? It means how many uh, degrees does she have? And what's the in degree of Magda? And what's the out degree of Magda? Now we could just go to this network and basically count it, just counting our arrows. This is, this is a directed network that we had here. Or we can do it a little bit systematically because if you have Twitter networks or Facebook networks or any kind of other networks with thousands and tens of and hundreds of thousands of nodes, you don't just want to count it manually. So basically what you do is you present nodes, uh, networks in matrix form in matrix, and use matrix algebra in order to do that. So I already showed you the adjacency matrix that uh, we, we created before. And now instead of having these arrows in the adjacency matrix, I just use zeros and ones. In this case, I assume that a self connection is a zero. So it doesn't really matter to me if somebody is connected to themselves. And every other previous error is now a one. And if there was no error, no connection, it's now a zero. The interesting thing is, the good thing is now you can basically just sum up these rows. So you see now you sum up the row of Jorge. I sum up the row. I can clearly one plus one is two, right? I can sum up Maria. So Maria is connected to Jorge and she's connected to Magda. So I know the out degree of Maria, two, two link, two, two links go out. There are two out degrees. So the out degree of Maria is two. So you connect to two people. I just summed up this row. Juan has no out degree. Juan himself doesn't connect to anybody. What about Magda? So what is the out degree of Magda? Yeah, it's also two. So if you put in a one, Magda connects to Maria and Magda connects to Juan, that's the out degree. What about the in degree? How many links get to you? Well, what you do basically now is you sum up the columns. 
So Jorge, and please take the time to make sure uh, that this is correct, so have a close look at it. Jorge receives two co uh, receives one connection only for Maria. So if a sum of the column is Jorge, only get a one. So Maria goes and connects to Jorge, right? Um, so Maria herself, she gets two in degrees, one from Jorge and one from Magda. So now I have here the degree distribution, the in and out degree distribution. I can also see how uniformly it's distributed. Often what we find in social networks is that there are exponentially few people, very few people who have exponentially many links and exponentially many people who have exponentially few links. These are called scale-free networks. The, the links is distributed according to a power law, extremely unequal, right? There are many people in the long tail of, of the network distribution. And if you represent it in this way, you can basically simply represent and quickly calculate the network distribution. Most network analysis works with matrix algebra. So if you have ever worked with matrix algebra, you will see some other terms later on that, that we will use here, like eigenvector centrality, for example. That's a term also for matrix algebra. So uh, the good, the good, the benefit is that often the computer does the matrix algebra, so you don't have to flip your matrices by hand. But if you ever had an insight into matrix algebra, well, network analysis is basically uh, applying matrix algebra. Okay, so this was about the links and how they are connected and, and, and how we can count them. What about now a more global view of the network? Like how can I roam around the network? Here we also have different terms, different jargons. For example, you can walk around the network. That means you just pass along nodes through the links. Kind of like, yeah. You walk over these bridges that connect the nodes and you walk around. A path is a specific kind of walk. You only pass through different nodes. You don't ever repeat any node when you walk and that's called a path. So for example, here we have a network and what I draw out here is a path and also a walk because every path is a walk but not the other way around. Um, from one to seven, right? We go from one to two, from two to three, from three to four, from four to five, five to six, six to seven. Now, this here, this walk is a walk which is not a path. I go from one to two, two, three, three, four, five, then I go back to three. So I've been at three twice, so that wouldn't be considered a path. That's called a walk. So, you know, you know the words walk and path, but when you do network analysis, these are technical terms that you have, you have to learn in order to be able to talk and analyze with other people, uh, social networks, for example. Now, there are also cycles. Yeah, that's really just a cycle. You go and, and you come back, very intuitive. So, for example, you start at the one and you go back at the one. So that's a cycle and a walk, by the way. Uh, not a path because you go to the one twice, right? So one, two, three, and you go around this, that's a, that's a cycle. Here you have uh, another cycle that you go one, two, three, four, five, three, one. So that's another cycle and a walk, again, not a path. So these are terms and you can see now we have, we walk, walk, path, cycles. And then you can also see how many cycles, possible cycles are there in a network. That is very interesting. Because you say, like, how often like, can a rumor, for example, come back to you? So it's important to count how many possible cycles there are and how many uh, rumors are there that go through path. That means they don't double cross somebody or how many they go through walks. So that's why it's important to define these, these concepts. Geodesic, a very important, comes from, from geography, this term. And that's the shortest path between two nodes. So it's the shortest path not a walk between two nodes. This being said, which one is or are the geodesic between nodes two and six in this network? Well, there are several ways you can go from node two to six. You could go from node two to three to four to five to six, but that would not be the shortest. So the shortest, the quickest way you can get to two to six is in three steps. And you can do that two ways, two, three, seven, six, or two, three, five, six. So the geodesic is 
three steps, there are three degrees of separation uh, between node two and node six. So that's the shortest path, which is very important all, often. Right? So how quickly can somebody reach somebody else? How, how, how many intermediating steps are there? What's the shortest path between these two? And that has the term geodesic. That's it. The diameter is the longest, shortest uh, path and the average path length is just the average of the geodesic. So I see, uh, what's the quickest way of getting from everybody to everybody? What's the quickest way? In our example, it was three. I could go two ways, but it's still three. And then I do that for everybody, and I count the average path length. And in some networks, I have a short average path length. Everybody can get to everybody quite quickly, and some I have a very long average path length. And that obviously has then effects, for example, if you want to do marketing, uh, how quickly you can reach people, or if you want to spread a new innovation, or a rumor, for example, or if a disease is spreading. Now, armed with these definitions, try to answer that question. What's the minimum possible average path length of a network? Think about it. What's the minimum possible, what's the minimum possible average path length of a network? The minimum, the smallest possible average path length of a network is one. That's when everybody is connected uh, to everybody. Because if you're connected to everybody, you can get to everybody in one step. And, and, and so can they. So if you have a network here of nine nodes, I need eight connections per node. I have 72 connections. So in these nine nodes with 72 uh, connections, I can, with 72 degrees, I can connect to everybody. Now that's an awful lot of connections and an awful lot of, of degrees uh, and degrees are often very costly. For example, if you want to connect to all of your friends, you don't have the time, right? That's very time intensive. And, and, and sometimes you might lose friends, they get upset because you don't give them enough attention. You have a scarcity in attention here that you can distribute. Um, a company might not have enough financial resources to maintain ties with everybody. Um, an airline company, for example, cannot fly directly to each airport, right? That would be just way too costly. Even so, well, if, if you would have a direct flight from every city to every city, fantastic. Well, they're not doing that because it, it would just be too costly. So that leads us to the question, what's kind of like a good mix between the number of links and the shortest average path length? And I will give part of the answer already away. Um, you can get the shortest average path length down to two. So in two steps, you can get from everybody to everybody, but you need way less links and degrees than you had before. Think about it. What is the network structure of that network? It looks like a star. Or it's sometimes called a hub and spoke network because you have this hub in the middle and then the spokes like in a, in, in a wheel. So here actually with our, with our, with our nine nodes, I only need eight links. And with that, I can, with these eight links, I can connect, uh, to the central node. And from the central node, I can get out to every other node. So I reduce the number of links significantly. Uh, but I still have a, a pretty short average path length, average path length of two. And that's actually what airline companies do, right? That's why you always end up in these cities, like, I don't know, like in, in Dallas and, and so forth, because that's where you change planes. So they all ship you there you, in the United States, usually in the middle of the country, and from there they distribute you out. So that's a mathematical problem, how you actually do that best. Uh, but you can still have a pretty short average path length if you have this hub and spoke network structure with these, with these central hubs. It turns out that society has a surprisingly small average path length. That means in, in very few steps, we're all connected to everybody. Actually, the, the term is there are six degrees of separation between you and everybody else on planet Earth. So between you and the seven to eight billion people that are planet Earth. And six degrees of separation, only going through six, that means it's you, it's a friend, a friend of a friend, a friend of a friend of a friend, a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend. And then already you can get to, on average, to, to 
to the most hidden faraway uh, person in Africa, in Asia, in Australia, in South America. That is kind of like what this idea says, uh, the six degrees of separation. How did we come up with that? Well, there was a researcher called Milgram and uh, he back in the 60s, 70s actually just sent, sent letters. So he sent letters from, from Nebraska and from Kansas. And he said, he gave this letter to somebody and said, um, this letter should go to somebody in Boston, in Massachusetts. But if you know this person already, by first name basis, send this letter directly to this person. If not, send it to a person that, that might know this person. So maybe you don't know. The, the, the final the final person, but you know somebody who is maybe in the same profession. I think it was a lawyer in Boston. So you might give it to a lawyer or you might give it to somebody who has maybe relatives in Boston. You know that. So it turned out that in 5.5 steps, the letters actually got to the right person in Boston. So that was in the 60s and 70s. Turns out on Facebook, the degrees of separation between everybody and planet Earth. So these are the 2 billion Facebook users, 2 out of 7 people on planet Earth are on Facebook, the degrees of separation is 4.7, so less than 5 degrees of separation there are actually. And, and this should not be too surprising actually. Think about it. Uh, how many friends do you have on Facebook? You, you don't have to answer that. I, uh, you probably don't. I, I don't know, but, but there is a lot, right? So now imagine you have a hundred friends on Facebooks that are not overlapping with the friends of your friends. Well, many of them are overlapping. You have many friends in common, but imagine you have a hundred friends uh, of Facebook that are not overlapping with, with, with this one friend, right? So you start, uh, you have a hundred friends and then this friend has also a hundred friends that are not overlapping with you. So now you already actually went to 10,000 people. Right, so if you go out, a uh, hundred friends of mine, and these hundred friends, each one of these hundred friends has a hundred friends that are not overlapping with me. Then I have a hundred I have, and each one of them has a hundred. So it's a hundred times a hundred. We are ten thousand people already. Well, that's 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 quite a lot. A ten thousand people. Now imagine each one of them has a hundred friends that are not overlapping with each one of them. Well, they have many more friends, but a hundred that are not overlapping. We already at one million. We have six zeros already. Right? A hundred and a and hundred and a hundred. We have six zeros already. We already at a, at, at, at a million people. Now let's do that again. Multiplied by a hundred. We had a hundred million already. And let's do it again. Multiplied by a hundred. We had 10 billion. Well, how many people are there on planet Earth? Well, seven, seven, seven point something, seven to eight billion, right? So we already have with, with one, two, three, four steps, we already went beyond the people that are on planet Earth. So that's the power of networks. This is exponentially multiplier effect that you have with networks just grew out. So it's not so surprising that actually with a small average path length, you can reach a very large group of people. Now, the average path length uh, is an average. It might be that if you want to get to the last person down out in Australia, you need more than four, five, or even six degrees of separation. You might need, I don't know, even 13, 14, 15, 20, because uh, there, there's a very intricate network structure. There are different clusters, different groups of people hang together in different ways, and, and you might need to walk around the network in intricate ways. And that's a ver another very interesting question of social network analysis. What are these kind of clusters? Uh, where are there and how many clusters are there and, and, and can we detect some kind of communities in the network? And, and these are technical terms. Community is different than a cluster. So here, for example, you have my LinkedIn network. Well, that's how my LinkedIn network was many years ago. Uh, so, but that many years ago, that's what it, what my LinkedIn network looked like. So I used to work at the United Nations Secretariat. Uh, for many years, and uh, the blue are people from the United Nations Secretariat in large. The green ones are from the United Nations in Latin America specifically. So I used uh, uh, to work a, a long time in Latin America with the UN, so they are connected to that. Now, and then you can see here the dark red ones, these are uh, contacts and friends and, and professional contacts I have in Chile. So the Secretariat of the UN. Uh, in Latin America happens to be headquartered in Santiago de Chile. So I have people connected there. Then on the other hand, I have uh, a different connection and that has to do with uh, my, my leg in academia. 
So I was at, at USC at the, at the time, at the University of Southern California. And there you can see a lot of connections here. That these are the orange ones. So you have different clusters and it makes sense. So if you look at your network, it makes sense of, of who is connected, who is connected with whom. And this has to do with community detection. So let's go a little bit more into that in understanding a community structure and how we can partition a network into different, different, different kind of groups. That's very important because it helps you to understand power relations, opinion formation, uh, polarization is very important in today's political climates. Group splits, for example, when they, uh, when they split up in companies, for example, as well, or mergers and, and acquisitions of different fields of knowledge. So it's a very, it's a very important field uh, for many, for many social science disciplines. One term, let's go through some of the terms so we become a little bit more technical. One term is called a clique. A clique is the strongest subgroup you can actually have. That's actually the technical definition of a clique. It's not kind of like the high school clique, but that's also that's also what it means. The high school clique is, it means everybody in this clique is connected to everybody else in the clique. Right? There's not like one link missing. Everybody, they're all, they're all besties. Right, they're all connected to each other. That's that's the technical definition of what a clique is. Now, cliques cliques can overlap, uh, and they can be extremely fragile, because if one connection breaks, right, if, if if two friends start fighting, the entire clique kind of like can 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 break off. So so they are very fragile because they depend on that everybody is connected to everybody. Another uh, less strong definition of a group in a network is called a component. And here we can distinguish between weakly connected and strongly connected uh, components. And then has to do if the network is directed or non-directed or undirected. You already know, know about that. So a weakly connected uh, component is if there is an undirected, that's why it's weak, it's undirected, there's no direction, path between every pair of nodes. So here, for example, in our, in our toy network, we have one component here, and one component here, and one component here. If the isolate, the isolate, the seven, if that's a component or not, I, well, you, you can or not. I mean, it's usually it's not because it has to be uh, between a pair, right? But here, yes, you see you have three components in this network. There are three non-directed paths uh, between between every pair. A strongly connected component has to do with a directed network, and that has to do with that every node is reachable from every other node. So for example, in this first big weakly connected component, you can, the, the one, the node one, is not part of the strongly connected component because it is not reachable from every other node. Like the one cannot reach any other node, actually. There's nothing going out from the one. So the one cannot reach the other. Whereas, whereas the two, three, and four, yes, that's reachable uh, going around. The five and the six also, they are all reachable. And uh, the other ones, think about it. The eight, nine, and 10, is that a strongly connected component or not? And if yes, why? And if no, why? It is not because the 10, the node 10 cannot be reached, right? There's nothing, no, no link going into, going into the 10. So it's not a strongly connected component. It's a weakly connected a component if it's undirected. A very important group or often a, a subgroup of a network are, are these triangles that you've already seen in these examples. And, and that has to do, that's often called clustering, triadic closure and transitivity. Transitivity is a term that's actually taken from mathematics. So if, you, if you've done some mathematics, you, you heard this term before. What it means here is basically how many triangles are closed or what fractions of my friends are also friends. So I'm here and I have two friends. And then are they also friends? Is this triangle uh, closed? And it turns out that in social networks, we can predict future friendships with very high likelihood if it's in this kind of situation. Eventually, your two friends will also meet. So I can now start actually, now we're going almost in network dynamics already, we're making some predictions about what will happen. Sooner or later, your friends 
will might also be friends and 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 that often actually what happens now th that's not the only the closed triad the, the triad closure is not the only triangle that we have actually we, i can make an entire census of triangles triangles are very important in social networks and here uh, you can see all 16 possible triad types they're also called often motives or isomorphism in a directed networks and these motives we then look for them so we go through the network and actually instead of looking at bigger groups you just say like how many of these motives one of these 16 tri triad motives can we find in the network you kind of like make a triad census around the network and then you can compare the amount of tries that you find in your network to some other network and say, well, in my network, I find a lot of this kind of substructure. So that's what you do in social network analysis. And it turns out that uh, completely connected cliques in a triad, that means uh, what is here called 300, appear more frequently than any other motive in social networks. So, so that's what I said before, right? Triads, closed cliques among three people are very common. So that's called a clustering coefficient. So the clustering coefficient is the number of triangles, the number of closed triplets of the number of, of connected uh, triplets of, of, all, of all the different nodes that you have in the network. So that gives you an indication, that's then one number, that gives you an indication of how many of these triangles are closed. So triangles you and your two friends and them being friends, that is extremely important and can tell us a lot about social network structure. On the other hand, if these triangles are missing, or some other connections are missing, uh, that can also give us something, some very interesting insights about social network. And that's where this term social capital comes from, or structural holes. So these are related to, I mean, there are many shades of grays and we, we cannot go into the details, but a structural hole, as you can think about it, is a separation between non-redundant non contexts. So here, what you can see in this network, there are three structural holes, right? So uh, A, it's kind of like the bottleneck between these structural holes and he brokers, A brokers between them. In this network here, it's E. So E is kind of like brokering these two, these two partitions of the network, these two groups, whereas here on the side we have structural holes. And that gives us information about, about the network structure, about the importance of different nodes. And often structural holes also tend to close. And if not, we would like to close them, right? especially in social networks if you want uh, if you want to diffuse an innovation sometimes sometimes you want to create structural holes for example if you try to have a vaccination if you try to stop the spread of something of a rumor or of a disease well it's good to have these structural holes because then it's very easy to control in this case i can control it just by controlling the node e or here i can control the node a so the structural these 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 brokers connect different partitions of the network. Now, we went through a lot of different definitions, a lot of different aspects of networks, and I threw a lot of different definitions and things at you to give you kind of like also an idea so how the, what the social network analysis is about and why it is uh, important, because it helps us to, give, to make predictions and to describe network structure. One last point, and I hear we'll need your attention. Um, you might have to watch this segment several times, has to do with network centrality. And that's a very important question. And that the question is, who is the center of the network? So one of the things, the first things that I made it last in this presentation, in this lecture, one of the first things you often calculate, I also often calculate when I analyze networks, is the centrality of the different nodes and the distribution of the centrality. And it has to do because you want to know who is in the center of the network. Then later on, you calculate your triads and your clusters and your partitions and so forth. But the center, uh, last but not least, uh, is a very important question. And it is not an easy question to answer. And actually, spoiler alert, it turns out that there are different kinds of definitions of who's in the center. Again, it depends on what you're actually after and what you try to model. So let's, let's have a look. Uh, at this question. So here I have a network, right? And my question is, which node is in the center? One, two, or three? 
what would you say just as a gut feeling? Well, it might be that you said the node number two is in the center. It is. It is in the center. It is. It is a broker actually that brokers two parts of this network. All right. So that's a. If you define a broker as being in the center, but then there might be more. But okay, that's a that's a reasonable definition. Let's see some formal definitions. The most popular definition of center is what's called degree centrality, and that's the most connected node, actually. That uh, makes a lot of sense. It's kind of like the most popular kid on the block, right? That kid is in the center. So if you go to your high school, there's this one popular kid that's connected to most people. So that kid is in the center. It has the most connections. So in a network analysis sense, that makes that is reasonable to assume. Or a celebrity. A celebrity, many people know the celebrity. So it has a lot of connection. That person is in the center or a politician, a decision maker, an agent of change that, yes, that has a lot of connections. So yes, it makes sense. So let's look at our network here. One, two or three. How many degrees, how many connections does each one of them have? Well, node number two, how many degrees? Two, right? It, goes to one and it goes to three. Okay, so two connections. Node number three, how many how many degrees? Well, three or, or three, three links. Now in degrees, out degrees, you can distinguish. Very good, very good point. Uh, and it has three. And node number one, how many? Four. Right? So actually the most popular kid on the block here, the one with the most connection, is node number one. So we would say formally, node number one has the highest degree centrality. Now, in directed networks, as I already alluded to, there's in degree, out degree, so you can have highest in degree centrality, highest out degree centrality. A celebrity, for example, might have a high in degree centrality, but actually not know so many people because they keep the celebrity kind of like in a bubble. Right, so the celebrity doesn't know a lot of people, even though many people know this person. Uh, so there might be a high in degree, but a but a but a small but a small out degree. But that's not the only definition of degree. The most popular kid of the block. There are also some another reasonable definition is to say uh, which is the node that is closest to everybody else, and that is not necessarily the same. You can be. Uh, you don't have to be have the, have the most connections, but you can still be very distant to somebody. It's because you're kind of like in some corner of the network and you have a lot of connections there, but to get to everybody in the network takes you a long time because you're in this particular corner. Even so, in this corner, you are highly connected, right? So there's a difference between having a lot of connections and being close to everybody else. So how do we count the closeness? Well, basically, we count the degrees of separation. Well, we are good at that already, right? Degrees of separation, we got that down. All right. So, so let's have a look at our network and let's count of our degrees of separation. So I start with node number one. And what are the degrees of separation to my left three nodes? How many steps do I need to get from node number one to my left three nodes? Well, one, one step, right? There's one degree of separation between node one and, and the left and the left three nodes. So one times three. Okay. So I count them one step to three nodes. So there are three degrees of separation, one and one and one in order to get, to get to these three nodes. To get from one to one, there's, there's no degree of separation. I, I'm already right there. To get from one to two, there's one, one degree of separation to get from one to three. There are two degrees of separation. I go from one to two, and then to three, right? And then what about the upper right? Well, the first one on the upper, on the upper right hand, I need three steps. Second one, I need four steps. And the last one, I need five steps, right? One, two, three, four, five. What about the lower three right? How many, how many steps do I need to get the lower three right? Well, yeah, good to know that you're still awake. Uh, yes, also three, four, five. Of course, that's the same. Now we can add them all up and see, well, the total uh, degrees of separation that I need to get from node one to everybody else. So I have, I have three 
plus one, four, plus two, six, and then I have three plus four plus five, that's uh, the seven, 12, uh, two times 24, uh, plus uh, the six on top, right? We have uh, 30, right? 30, okay, good. So we have, in order to get from one to every, every other node, we have, we need 30 steps. Okay, that's the number. Let's do it for node number two. So for node number two to get to the left three nodes, I need two steps. I have two degrees of separation between node number two and the left three nodes, right? I have this three times, so two steps times times three nodes. To get to one, I need one step. To get from two to two, nothing. From two to three, I only also get one step. Now to the upper three nodes, I need two steps, three steps, four steps. And to the lower three nodes, I need two steps, three steps, four steps as well. So in total then, I get the sum is 26. Good, good. I, I don't have your ass asleep that, you know, like something, something's still working. Great. I'm happy to, see. you just, you sum it up and you get, you get 26. So uh, in order to get from node two to everybody else, I need 26 steps or the total of 26 degrees of separation. So that's actually closer. Number two only needs 26 degrees of separation, only has 26 degrees of separation, whereas node number one has 30 degrees of separation between itself and everybody else. So node number two has a higher closeness centrality. That's how we say it. What about node number three? Please try to do it by yourself. Do exactly what we did for node number one, node number two. Do it for each one, write them down, and then sum them up. What do you get? So for the left three nodes, for the left three nodes, in order to get through them from node number three, I have, I need three steps, right? Go to two, to one, and then get to the, to the left three nodes. So I need three steps times three. So, so that's what I have there. To get to node number one, I need two steps. Node number two, one step. Node number three, I'm already there. And then the upper right, I need one, two, three steps. And the lower right as well, one, two, three steps. So in total, if I sum that up, I get 24. So it turns out that three is actually closest to everybody else. That's because three is close to this big group on the right-hand side where you have the upper and the lower. So it's close, it can reach them uh, very quickly. And this group is bigger than, than on the other side. So it turns out that if I want to get quickly to all the nodes, if I have a message that quickly goes to all the nodes, node number three is my candidate. So node number three has the, 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 the highest closeness centrality. Actually, so these numbers, as I said, they go down. So you usually take, uh, you take the reciprocal, you, you, you divide it by this number, and then you get a high closeness centrality for low number of degrees of separation, right? You put it underneath the fraction. So that's how you would calculate that. So node number three has the highest closeness centrality. Node number one has the highest degree centrality. So going back to our question, which one is the center of the network? Well, that, that depends on, on what you're interested in. I give you one more and give you, and there, there, there's m m several others, but the, the most three, the three most popular are these ones. And that is the between centrality. And that's an interesting question. So degree centrality is like how many connections do you have? Closeness, how close you are. In betweenness is how often does this node lie on the path that's connecting every node with every node, the path, right? So that's, uh, you know what a path is. And these are, have a very important role because they are gatekeepers, intermediaries, uh, uh, brokers on average, because we have on average have to pass through this node more often. So they have a very uh, important role, nodes with a high betweenness centrality. That's that's actually the, the technical term. Your spell checker won't know it, but it is. It is correct, between us, and that's, that's how you write. And it makes sense, it's the nodes that are between. So, so let's count that as well, since we're already in that, and since the last thing we're going to go through for today, let's count it. It's the sum of the shortest path through a node, or, or, all shortest paths. So we have node number one. So how often do I have to go through node number one 
if I want to come from the left three nodes to go to all the other ones. Well, on top, the top, the top left node has to go, well, one time through the one to go to the two, another time through the one to go to the three, and then a second time, then third, four, five times to go to the upper three, right? Um, six, seven, eight times to go to the lower three. And then it also has to go to these other bodies over here, right? So these are the two, these two bodies on the left hand side. It also has to go through node number one. So it's uh, nine, ten. So it has to go, th this upper node has to go ten times through node number one in order to reach all the other nodes in the network. The same happens to the other two nodes on the left side, right? So the middle left node and the down left node also has to go 10 times through node number one. If you don't believe me, please do the exercise and count it for yourself. It has to go through node number one 10 times in order to reach all other nodes. So now I have three, three, three nodes, the three nodes, and I have to go 10 times through node number, number one. So in total, I get 30 times I have to go to node number one just from this left-hand th three nodes. Node number one, in order to get, well, yeah, that's again, like node number one doesn't have to go through node number one in order to go anywhere. Uh, node number two has to go through node number one three times. When? When are these three times it has to go through node number one? Well, the three times it wants to reach the left, the left three nodes, right? Then it has to go through node number one. So yes, three times. If it goes to these other nodes, if it wants, if two wants to go to three and so forth, it doesn't have to go through node number one. Node number three has to go through node number one. How often in order to reach certain nodes? Also three times. In order to reach number two, it doesn't have to go through node number one. But in order to, again, to reach the three left-hand node, right, it needs to, it knows, it needs to go through node number one, so also three. Then uh, the right six nodes, we just put them all together, make it a little, little simpler, uh, in order to go through node number one, kind of like the same, sh the same spiel, right, in order of each one of these right six ones in order has to go through node number one uh, if it wants to reach the three left ones. Right, so there are six nodes on the right hand, on this right hand cluster and this right hand side, and they have to go, each one of them has to go three times through it. So, okay, so now we have these numbers. We have um, 30 we have on the left side, then we have uh, plus three, plus three, that's 36, uh, plus 18. Somebody has a calculator handy? 54. Good, good, you're still with me. So 54 times we have to go through node number one if you want to reach from every node to every other node. All right? All right, let's do the same for node number two. We're going to walk you through uh, uh, quite quickly. Enjoy the show. So if I go from the left three nodes, I have to go through it seven times because there's seven nodes on the other side of the node number two. Then also for node number one, it's kind of like in the same condition as these left three. I have to go seven times through the node number two. Node number two to two is nothing. Then from node number three, the other way around, I go four times through node number two. That's the left three plus, plus the node number one. All right, good. And the right three nodes, also four times. Same idea, the, the right six nodes actually, because the upper and the lower are in the same condition. They're in the same condition as the node number three, right? They have to go four times through it. So here we get 56. So we have to go to node number two 56 times. So the between a centrality of node number two is higher than node number one. In order to go from every node to every node, I have to go more often through node number two. All right, so node number two is, is, has a critical role here on, on the path between, between all the nodes. All right, let's test node number three. Please, again, do it for yourself, what we just did. Feel free to rewatch it if you're not absolutely sure what we just did. And please map out uh, node number three. What's, what's how often do you have to go through node number three in order to reach from every node to every other node? So 
good that you're still with me. And, and that's just counting. There's no higher math or something involved. The good news is that if you do computational uh, network analysis, you will use computers to count that. Uh, so you won't have to count it by hand. But it's important to do that once for you to understand what it actually means. And that's a very important concept, betweenness, right? How often is a node between the path of other nodes? Okay, so node number three, I hope you got that. Three times six plus six plus six plus nothing from node number three to node number three is nothing. And then six times eight. That gives you 78. So node number three has by far the highest between us centrality. That basically comes from the fact that if you have the upper three nodes, right, the upper three nodes in order to go to the lower three nodes, it also has to go through number three. So there you get a, a, a big intermediate function. So node number three mediates the upper and the lower three nodes. So there it gets, it gets this intermediation power from. So node number three has the highest Betweenness centrality is the biggest bottleneck gatekeeper intermediary broker on average that we have in this network among these three nodes, node number, number one, node number two, number three. So now we saw that actually node number two, which intuitively at the beginning we thought like, well, yeah, that's in the center. According to these three centrality metrics, it's, it's not in the center, right? It's not been in the center. It's not, it's not the most popular. It's not degree centrality. It's not the closest to everybody else. It's not closeness centrality. And it's not the one that lies most frequently on the path between all others, potentially blocking it. Between a centrality, then, can also be used to give us some other insight. Let's go back to the question of community partitioning. So how many different groups are in this network, right? So if I know the nodes that are most often in between the other nodes. So these are very crucial nodes, right? If I would delete these nodes, the network could break apart. So that might give me an indication of that these nodes are kind of like the bridge builders between some clusters in, in our, in our case. Here, for example, node number three, kind of like build the bridge between almost three clusters, three clusters. So between the, the left hand side, between the upper right hand side and between the lower right hand side. That's how it got so much between a centrality power out of it, because it mediates between three groups, whereas node number one, node number two only mediated between two groups. So if I understand the highest between a centrality, I might get a good idea about what are different groups in a network. Now, if I do it like this by hand, as we do it right now to understand this concept, that's easy. But imagine uh, a social media networks with tens and hundreds of thousands of nodes, then, you know, you, you, you calculate the between the centrality. And that brings us to back to this question of, of community partitioning. So a very famous algorithm, the Gervin Newman algorithm takes advantage of that. So what this uh, does, it uses between us in order to detect different groups, different communities in the network. So it first calculates the between us between all of the existing ties. That's a lot of computation. Good that we have computers. Good that we do computational social science here because that's a lot of computation. Uh, imagine for a big network. Then it removes the ties. As a second step, it removes the ties with the highest between us. If, if it's really, a, if it's a broker, the network will, will break apart, right, in that case. And then you have your two clusters. Then, but what it often, if it doesn't break apart, it just recalculates the between us among all other ties again. And, and repeat a step two and three again. So it does that. It deletes with the highest, with the highest between us, then recalculates the between us because that might now change. Of course, if you delete an important bridge builder, you have to recalculate your between us. And again, great that we have computers. You don't want to do this by hand. And then at the end, you can detect different, different clusters. Now you can do this uh, recurrent algorithm, this recursion until you're left with two nodes. Now that's not the idea. So you want to have one criteria to stop the algorithm. And that's uh, what's here used is called modularity. And that's a good ratio between uh, the density of links within these groups, these, these groups, these, these clusters that, that you found and between them. And when that's a very, so you calculate that, the algorithm also calculates that at each step. So you delete a node with the highest between us and then you calculate the modularity, how many 
how, how high the modularity is literally, so how high the density is within these clusters and between them. And if you get there to an optimal, to an optimal, uh, to an optimal measure, that's when you stop. So I did this here for countries around the world and their telecommunications network. Actually, that was back when there was a, mainly a fixed line network. So these, the links here is fixed line telephone connections when somebody from one country calls somebody from another country. So I took this network, I threw it into a social network analysis software, I run the Gervin Newman algorithm, and it turned out that, well, that's the result. What do you see in the world? How many different groups can you identify within this global network? And do you guess what they represent? They represent world regions and they have, they have been detected four of them. So the blue one down here are the Americas, uh, so North and South America. Uh, the green one are, is Europe. The red one are Asian countries and the purple one on top are African countries. That means people basically call other people in neighboring countries. And that's why these networks kind of like cluster, cluster together according to the world regions. Now, something very interesting happens here as well, and the exceptions make the rule. You can see three countries here that are actually in the America, so they are blue, but they are very close to Europe. Uh, and that is Spain, Brazil, and the United States. Now, interesting, so Brazil and the United States, being in the Americas, so are actually close to Europe by Spain, that's a European country. But Spain, what the algorithm told me, actually should be, and the telecommunication networks are, should be considered part of the Americas. So the algorithm tells me actually in the network, uh, in the, from a network uh, structure perspective, Spain is much closer to Latin America, probably, right? As, as they both speak Spanish, Spain and, and Latin American countries. So there are a lot of connections there. Then Spain is, 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 is with Europe. So actually the algorithm here reveals something interesting about about the structure and, and if you do this you can see you can use between us to, to identify these different clusters group communities that you have when you start to partition a network and you try to detect community structure all right so back from this interlude back to our centrality i walked you through these three centrality degree centrality closeness between us and but there are other ones uh, there are many others that are just as reasonable and just as important. It depends on what you're looking for. One very important, one very common one is called eigenvector centrality. Eigenvector, that's a concept, concept again from linear algebra, from matrix algebra. And um, that has to do with the friends of your friends. So degree centrality, for example, makes you very popular if you have a lot of connections. But then you might have a lot of connections, but all your friends might be hermits, right? They, they might not have friends themselves. So what eigenvector centrality asks is, are you connected to people who are popular themselves? Right? Are you connected? Are your friends, do they have also a lot of friends themselves? So it goes out one degree and with the eigenvector, actually you can, you can go out and out and out uh, and, and calculate the highest eigenvector centrality. Right? So it's proportional to the sum of the neighbor's centrality. That's, that's what it calculates. Google's famous page rank, that's the algorithm that ranks the pages on your search result. That's, that's the algorithm that converted Google into this huge company that it is today, uses actually eigenvector centrality, right? So the page rank, if you, if you search something in Google, is proportional to the sum of the rank of the linked pages. It means if a page links to your page and this page, nobody links to it, that doesn't give you many points. However, if a very popular page links to you, I don't know, if the New York Times uh, or CNN or whatever would link to your page, or well, then your page would become, well, get more points in this page rank algorithm. I'm not going to walk you through, don't worry, we, we've done enough counting for today. There, with no to calculate eigenvector centrality, really use a computer and we're going to go to software soon and we can calculate these things then with a computer.
Now, in order to have a, a case study here, uh, eigenvector centrality in some cases is extremely important. For example, in the diffusion of innovation, and that's that's one application here, one case study I want to leave you with. For example, what this group here did uh, around Professor Jackson from Stanford is they they studied the diffusion of microfinance. So they went to 75 rural villages in India that did not have microfinance mechanism. So they didn't have this innovation. And then the bank, the bank that had the idea to spread this innovation, uh, entered in 43 of them and started to offer microfinance. Now you go into a new market, the idea is low. So who do you, who do you offer it uh, to? Well, you could offer it to the most popular, to the most popular kid. And that's what's often done in marketing, especially, right? You hire a celebrity. You hire somebody, Kim Kardashian or Lionel Messi or somebody everybody knows who has, this has a, a high out degree centrality because it's a big microphone that spreads it. Okay, so you could do that. Um, or you can use some other between as maybe closeness, somebody is close to somebody, or eigenvector centrality. So that was the question, what matters here? Um, or is it more the characteristics of the people that matter? Well, the first question that you then, in order for that, for that question to answer, the first challenge that you meet is how to represent the network. That brings me back to the beginning of the lecture. And, and that's, that's always what you have to decide. And, and that comes of your creativity, ingenuity as, as a researcher that that models reality. So the question with microfinance, a very reasonable question is, uh, who, would you, who would you borrow from? And, and they asked this question with 13 different kinds of, it was kind of like a multiplex network. It was a multiplex network, always the same people. And then they asked different questions to make different kind of ties. For example, they asked, who would you borrow money from? Well, you get this kind of network. And if you ask them, who would you buy, borrow kerosene from, you get a different kind of network. Who do you go to the temple with? You get a different kind of network. And who do you ask for advice? You get again a different kind of network, right? So they did like 13 of these kind of networks and a, a multiplex network, basically, and then started to analyze what matters in the diffusion of this innovation. And they found degree centrality is not what really mattered. That didn't push the innovation forward. But eigenvector centrality, yes, that had a big effect. So you contact, if you contact first those whose friends have also many friends, then you take advantage of this multiplier effect, right? So you don't go to the most popular, you go to the ones, the agents of change that also themselves have a big circle of influence among them. And that really spread the innovation the fastest. Now, there's discussion about that doesn't apply to every case. I mean, this case is a small village in, in rural India. Uh, there might be other centralities measures, but that's what you can get at. Once you have the tools of network analysis under your belt, you can analyze and study who to contact in what case, if you do that, try to spread an innovation in a social network with millions of users, you might get to a different result. But these tools are now available and, and, and you can calculate and, and actually make a science out of that instead of just betting on getting the biggest celebrity, spending a lot of money and maybe being suboptimal in spreading your message, be it marketing, be it a political opinion, or be it any other kind of technological uh, innovation. All right, that brings us to the end of our second part of today. And these are the different network measures. And we have three kinds of network measures that I actually ran you through and I mixed them all up because I just gave you again this two to force through a lot of different kind of things. But now at the end that you have some understanding of some of them, I can summarize them by saying, Look, there, there are basically three kind of things you can measure in the network. First of all, you can have kind of like one number to categorize the entire network. For example, the average degree or the average path length. Now you need the entire network in order to calculate the average path length, right? And then you can compare two networks and you can say, well, this network has a lower average path length than this network or has a more unequal degree distribution than the other network, right? So you need then you have one number at the end that summarizes the entire network. 
We also talked about some local measures, for example, the clustering, the triangles, for example, and you can see how much of these local characteristics are there in one network. Right? Then you can also compare among networks, but basically you can see you have a local measure and you have several numbers per network. So globally, you have one number per network, you have several numbers per network. And finally, you can have one number per node. For example, closeness centrality, it shows you, it gives you a number each node, how far is it from each other node, right? So you get one number per node. So actually you have one number per network, one number per local measure, or one number per node. And, and, and then you can also, of course, once you have one number per node, you can look at the distribution of these one number and, and so forth. But these are the three things they are basically also mixed together, but you can think about it like this. So these are the three ways you can abstract and measure a network. And that closes now our talk, our second point, like how can we describe the structure of a network? How can we measure a network? And that brings us to our last point. How can we analyze a network with a software? And that is uh, then part of our lab. But let me start a little bit. Network, network analysis software uh, has come a long way. And also network analysis only became possible thanks to the software. I mean, you saw how tedious it is <laughs> to count these things by hand. It's really impossible. So network analysis has been around since the 60s. And people have been reasoning about it. And but you know, once you get beyond 20 nodes or 30 nodes, it's really difficult to to still do network analysis. Uh, but with a computer, yes, you can just rattle it through. And the faster your computer is, some very large networks, not even the computer can get to them. Uh, but then you can make approximations. And since we have these powerful computers, network analysis really got a big boost. And there have been several several softwares as well that allow to analyze actually uh, this, this network structure. Uh, last time I count, I actually have been observing this because I'm using these softwares as well as many of my colleagues and trying to see also which software to use uh, for myself and to teach you. Last time I looked at it in 2013 in this Wikipedia site of social network analysis software, there were a hundred different softwares listed. Now, now the good news is five years later in 2018, there are only 15 listed. So there seems to be kind of like a process of consolidation going on where, where some softwares merge or we find out which ones are useful. Some are more, more useful than others or more, more often used, more user friendly, have more investment behind. And these softwares have still different advantages. I mean, among these 15, some are very plug and play. They make it easy. Uh, they have very many predefined buttons. Some are very flexible. Uh, so, for example, if you work with R yourself and you do network analysis with R, it's very flexible. You program it yourself. Some others give you the pretty pictures, for example. So, yeah, so when we analyze it, I, I do the same as well. So if I might use the plug and play to calculate something quickly. Then I use the special one in order to calculate some specific things that are not in the plug and play solution. And then I use another one you know, to make the pretty picture. So, so there are complementary benefits uh, of, of different softwares. One of the more common ones, one of the basic one is called Gephi. That's the software we will work with. That's pretty much the starter. It's kind of like, you know, the Excel for network analysis, the SPSS if you do statistical analysis. Uh, and we can get going with it extremely quickly. Now, when you work with different softwares or different tools, not only that your output is different, also your input is different. And as a final caveat, I want to uh, talk about that because that connects to something we talked about during the lecture. It's the, it's the network representation. So we had our network here, which was Jorge, Maria, Juan y Magda, and I represented it as an adjacency matrix. So in this adjacency matrix, um, we have one person that's connected to the other person up here. And for some softwares, you can just take this adjacency matrix and feed it in and it spits out the network graph. So you would put in this network, uh, this adjacency matrix, and it gives you, it gives you this graph as a result. Now, but there are other ways to represent a network in a data format, right? So this is an adjacency list here. So you have Jorge, who is connected to Maria and Magda, and you just simply write it out. So who is Jorge connected to? Well, Maria and Magda. Who is Maria connected to? Jorge and Magda. Who is Juan connected to? Nobody. 
So we just basically write nobody in this line. So that's an adjacency list. And for some network analysis software, you just give basically this this list and and, and it. Uh, you upload it and then you get this network graph. And then some very common one is an edge list. So a third way of representing your network. So you have the source and the target. So basically here you have one line per connection, per degree. So Jorge connects to Maria, Jorge connects to Magda, Maria connects to Jorge, da, 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 and Magda connects to Juan. So I have here one line per degree in my network. If you, for example, go to this very common network software, Gephi, that's what you of, how you often would represent your network, through an edge list. So you have all these edges. Edges are links. That's the, the mathematical term for it, vertices and edges. And uh, vertices are the nodes. And, and, and links are the edges. And so you have an edge list, you have one connection per list, and, and you basically plug it in like this, and then the software will spit out the network. So there are some caveats of, of how you have to work with that. And the way I presented it today is not necessarily the only way of how to represent a network.